everyone, I am Marie Walker and I am the director of the Ada May Ivester Education Center here at the Northeast Georgia History Center. And today I'm going to be talking to you about the history of sewing. So, 17,500 BC, the first sewing needle with an eye is found or invented, perhaps. Archaeologists and anthropologists have discovered sewing needles with eyes dating back to at least that time, which were likely made of bone and they were used to sew skins and furs together. So right here I have, we, we use the same technology to this day. Perhaps could have gone back even earlier, but that is when we have the first ones that we have found dated to. So a needle with an eye is well, it's a, today it's a straight piece of metal, and then the eye of the needle is a little hole right at the top of the needle in which you can put the thread through. So thread, threading the needle is sometimes hard. It went through right on the first time for me. That doesn't always happen. But. Uh, so now you can kind of see I have this thread going through the eye of the needle. So this is what people use for thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands of years to make their clothing, to make their bed hangings, to make anything out of fabric or skin or fur. If you are trying to sew two pieces of something together, you're going to be using this until the 1700s. Well, really you're still going to be using this in the 1700s, but the 1700s is when we still, we have this idea that perhaps it could be easier to sew. And in 1755, Charles Weisenthal takes out a patent for a mechanical sewing machine. Weisenthal was a German immigrant living in London who took out a patent for a needle meant for mechanical sewing in 1755. There's no record of any machine to accompany this mechanical needle idea of his, and it has never been found. But this is recognized as one of the first events that would eventually lead to a sewing machine. In 1790, at the end of that uh, 18th century, we have Thomas Saint who patents an early sewing machine. Although his machine was never built, a London cabinet maker uh, was his trade and he successfully patented, well, a crude type of sewing machine in 1790. Thomas Saint also built plans for his machine, which were not discovered until the 1800s. And it would not work without modification, really, his machine as he designed it. But it is nonetheless an important step on the road to an actual sewing machine away from needle and thread. But in 1830, Bartholomew Timonier invents the first actual practical sewing machine. In 1830, he got the patent by the, from the French government for his sewing machine. Though he initially imagined it as being an embroidery machine, he found its true purpose to be a sewing machine. And it was practical and efficient. It used a barbed needle and was built almost entirely out of wood. At some point, he had a factory running with these sewing machines of about 80 people working them. He also sold his sewing machine for commercial use, which is really the first time that it was ever on the market to everyday people. So a lot of people really liked the idea of a sewing machine, but some people didn't. In 1831, French tailors rioted over Bartholomew Timionier's sewing machine. They thought his patent sewing machine changed the world that they were living in and were going to run them out of business. So while a lot of people really liked the idea of the sewing machine, there were also a lot of people who didn't like this idea and thought that the needle and thread that they've been using for thousands upon thousands upon thousands of years was going to be the best way to sew things and that a sewing machine, even though it was faster, was not as perhaps uh, skilled or um, you couldn't do as fine of detail work, which is true. So I think there is value in both of them, but 
sewing machines are far, far faster if you're just doing a running stitch. So it really wasn't until 1844 when Elias Howe invented the first modern sewing machine. Though many brilliant inventors produce sewing equipment, most Americans claim that Elias Howe from Massachusetts invented the first modern practical sewing machine in 1844. This is going to be basically the sewing machine that we know today. Up until this point, sewing machines, well, they didn't exactly look like the sewing machines that we're used to. Some of them had the needle going sideways through the machine. Uh, this is the first time where we see it going up and down like we're used to. Now, unfortunately, the machine didn't catch on immediately, even though it amazed people at it sewing competitions, where it out sewed some of America's finest tailors in quickness. But it didn't exactly catch on until the 1850s. In 1851, the first Singer sewing machine was patented. There's also a lot of dispute with Singer and Elias Howe and who patented what and who made money off of what, and it seemed like Elias Howe was really the first, and Singer kind of stole the patent, but Singer was able to market it better, and they made a few modifications which made it work better. So there was a, there's a whole long, drawn-out legal battle that I'm not going to get into between, between Singer and Howe, but just know that that happened. But on August 12, 1851, Isaac Merrick Singer patented what is first known as the like modern practical sewing machine that everyone was actually going to use. But of course, as I said, lots of patent and legal disputes around this Singer's invention, but Singer was eventually able to formalize an affordable payment plan for his machines, bringing them to American households, which none no one else had been able to do. No other company had been able to make it a affordable object that could actually affect the lives of everyday people. And Singer, you've probably heard that name before because they made it accessible. They made the sewing machine accessible to people. They had a payment plan because sewing machines were still really expensive and they aren't going to find their way into American households perhaps lower class American households until the end of the 1800s, even though in 1850 is kind of when they started. We are now going to look at some of the sewing technology from that time. We are now going to be looking at a sewing machine from 1886. It has this nice little box that goes over it and a very, very bent key that does still work uh, if you put it right in here. This is a Singer sewing machine from 1886. I know that because Singer has a patent mark that is right here. And it says that it is F7167235. And I'm able to go and look that up and see when it, that patent number was manufactured. So it, all Singers have them. It's super cool to go and, and look up old Singer sewing machines. Now there's kind of two types of sewing machines that were, uh, I would say they were kind of developed along each side of each other and that's uh, the treadle sewing machine and the hand crank sewing machine. This sewing machine is a hand crank sewing machine. I usually think of hand crank sewing machines as being earlier than the treadle sewing machines. I think treadle sewing machines perhaps were more popular. Uh, that's just my, my guess and personal opinion, I don't have necessarily a fact to back that one up uh, because people's preference doesn't have a tendency to um, display itself with fact all that much, except for in sale numbers. Now, the hand crank sewing machine, well, it works by, you guessed it, a hand crank. So here, you can see I'm cranking the sewing machine, goes through this wheel right here and then it makes my needle go up and down. Now you have to go one way or the other otherwise you're going backwards and won't let me go do that.
All right. So here you can see I have the machine threaded. Thread goes here, up, down, up, down, up, down, through the side, over, down to the needle. And then I also have, this is where the bobbin goes. It's a drop bobbin and it goes in right here. Another thing I really love about Singers is just how decorative they are. You can tell it, this has had more decoration on it, but is rubbed off over the past 140 odd years. But it has a nice decorative mark in the middle here that has worn off, but the sides still have a nice decorative. More has worn off on the front than in the back here, uh, just probably because fabric going over it for hundreds of years. And then it has this nice singer. It has, of course, the singer mark on it right next to the number. And then also on the top says, uh, I think it just says the Singer Manufacturing Company. But you always know it's a singer. They like to put their name on it. <laughs> and I think they do so very prettily as well. So now I don't have a sewing machine to show you, but I have a 19th century sewing table. So this is kind of like a sewing basket that we would have today or a sewing box. They had those too, but there was also this trend, this, uh, well, it was kind of longer than a trend. It was a, a way of doing things if you were a fancy person for a while. And that is a sewing table, but it functions basically the same as a sewing box where you keep your threads, your needles, and all of your other sewing supplies. You maybe even your, your yarn, your knitting, other embroidery type things, it's kind of like a craft table, uh, but it's called a sewing table usually. Now it's a very, it's a nice uh, sewing table. It's been scuffed up here on the top over the centuries, which I think is really interesting about this table, as well as a lot of furniture from the 19th century, is that it moves. This, it has wheels on the bottom, very old wheels that don't roll super great, but it has, it has wheels. They only, I think they basically only roll one direction uh, because furniture was supposed to be movable and your living space was going to be versatile. And I think that's really interesting because today we have an idea of furniture being more set and firm. And once it's put down there, we might rearrange every once in a while, but we're not going to just after dinner, push all of the furniture away and have a dance party. And that was something that was more common in the 1900s, 1800s. So I think that's just uh, a, a cool facet of earlier century furniture. So now we're gonna look inside. So it has this nice little table. It comes up to here. It stands at a 90 degree angle, so it's not to be folded all the way back and used as a larger table. It, it just folds up to here so that you can see all of your little pretties displayed in, in here. We have a not, lot of little nice cubbies for different types of things. I don't have anything stored in here. Um, I'm just using it as a, I use it more as just like a decorative tool. Uh, but I guess you, you definitely could store things in here. There's nice little, little cubby holes. There's bigger cubby holes. On the two front sides here, we actually have little, um, little, like, so it still has little cubby lids. It's all nicely padded with some very nice fabric. Oop, go back into your little cubby hole. There we go. And then the largest cubby hole by far is in the center here where we have our top, and then it goes all the way down through this fabric portion. This fabric portion is useful space. This is where I could stick some skeins of yarn. I can stick needles, like knitting needles, large ones, and it's going to be like my largest cubby hole. I could put a whole sewing or embroidery project in there. It could fit a small embroidery hoop. It's very large, and because it, it goes all the way down to the end of these decorative tassels. So this is something that a fine lady is going to have. This is something that is going to be more expensive. It's going to be in a nicer home. If you are of a lower class, you probably are just going to have a box. You aren't going to have a whole table dedicated to your sewing trinkets, especially one that's this nice. 
and now we are going to go to my home where we are going to look at a treadle sewing machine from 1913 that was too large to come to the History Center. Now we will be looking at a treadle sewing machine. Treadle sewing machines kind of came along at the same time as hand crank sewing machines, but became widely available a little bit after. I would date hand crank sewing machines to be before this, and then you have the treadle sewing machine. This treadle sewing machine is from 1913. And now I'm going to show you a little bit. We're going to go through all the drawers and all the nooks and crannies and see how this works. It turns into a wonderful table. Then, if I press this button right here, You'll have to forgive it. It's 107 years old, so sometimes it takes a little time to come up, but it's this absolutely gorgeous Singer Treadle sewing machine that was given to me. And I can't get over how pretty it is. So up here in our galleries, we also have an example of a treadle sewing machine. This one looks a little bit different than the treadle sewing machine that I showed you. Uh, this one, it has a table. Uh, it still has, um, here, let me move this a little bit so you can see. So here's the table that folds down and out. So this sewing machine, again, is going to be one that raises and lowers. It has a nice little sling pocket down here to where it's going to go down to. But this is a, a treadle sewing machine. It is a also, again, it's a Singer. Singer is incredibly popular because they made their sewing machines affordable with the payment plan like we talked about earlier. This one's serial number is G9242841. So this is, again, it has a beautiful Singer design, Singer logo. Uh, I think it's so interesting that they all have different decorative elements to it. Um, to the different uh, Singer sewing machines, they all have a little bit different of decorative design, but they also have all beautiful metal design on the front here. So a treadle sewing machine works with, well, the treadle. This treadle sewing machine no longer works because it doesn't have a belt that is going to connect the treadle wheel down here to the treadle, to the sewing machine wheel up here. But you can see the holes that are left where the cord would have come up and through and down. So I'm, I can push the treadle without fear of it moving anything up here. But the treadle is going to work, uh, I'm going to demonstrate with my hand here. So there, it go, you know, you push back and it operates the wheel here and then forward and back and forward. Now, one of the hard parts of sewing is getting the wheel to move continuously in the same direction instead of just spinning up and down like that. So if I just like do this and I'm not doing it in a good rhythm and it's a small rhythm, the wheel is just going to go back and forth, back and forth. And I'm not actually going to do any sewing because it's going to be centered on the same spot. I'm not actually getting it to go anywhere. So I'm going to have to go back, heel, toe, heel, toe. There you go. And then once you get it going in a good rhythm, it'll actually sew in a straight line in the same direction. So I'm up here in our galleries, and we're going to look at two of the sewing machines that we have on display in our collection. And that is this Singer motorized sewing machine, which is super, super cool. In just a moment here, you'll be able to see that there is a giant motor on the back of this. On the back here, it says that it has a sewing motor and that it is catalog 310. It is 100, 110 volts. And that is what's going to be powering the sewing machine. I think it's very interesting. As you can see, it has from the motor, it has a belt that is driven up to the wheel on the top of the sewing machine. That's the same type of belt that is used on a treadle sewing machine. It's the same type of 
crank motion that you're going to be using with a hand crank sewing machine. So all of those are going to be trying to, well, make this wheel turn up here on the side. This is the first one that I've seen that has a light bulb. My modern sewing machine has a light bulb and this one does as well, which helps you to see all of your stitches really clearly. You can tell this one is also, it has electricity, it's motorized, uh, but on the side here, you can see the plug-in for the electric socket. And this one, it has a small fold-out table. Sometimes we call these on modern sewing machines a quilting table that connects to the sewing machine, but this one looks like it it just kind of folds up or, or down to for storage purposes, but you're going to always have it there. It, if we were to fold it up, you would see on the far side here that that's where the bobbin is. So the bobbin is down under. Uh, it's not on top like some of the other sewing machines that we've seen, uh, the two other ones that we've seen today. But this is one that it, it kind of transitions to the bottom uh, when you start to have motorized sewing machines and then it starts to transition back up to the top actually when you have sewing machines in the early 2010s like mine. Of course, this is a Singer, so it's highly decorative. It has beautiful decoration around the edges, metal work around the wheel here. Um, it's, it's really, again, quite a beautiful machine. So here we have what I've never actually seen before other than in our collection. And I assume this to be a child's hand crank sewing machine, which is the bare basic functions of a sewing machine. It's super cute. It's very small, smaller than any other of the sewing machines because it just, it forms the just very basic function of teaching a child to sew. But of course you can, you can sew, uh, I guess really anything on this as long as it's not too big uh, because the arm only extends so long. Uh, but it has a nice hand crank there and it, operates the needle going up and down. This might be a super old-fashioned one that does not necessarily have a bobbin, but it makes a chain stitch. <laughs> so this is a modern, you know, um, from the very early 2010s <laughs> sewing machine. That is my sewing machine that I basically learned to sew on. Uh, we're, we're jumping ahead about 100 years now to see what does one sew with in the 21st century. Of course, we have the nice modern carrying case. Now this is my brother's sewing machine. Some similarities, some differences. This one, it being plastic instead of wooden metal. It's much lighter. It also has these cords, which indicate electricity. Uh, the first electric sewing machine came about earlier than you probably think, but it did not catch on as most people did not have electricity reliably until mid-1900s. But this is my sewing machine. Uh, very, it, it reminds me a lot of the treadle sewing machine because we still have like a pedal that you're going to use to to do with your foot. So you, you still have that kind of pedal motion where you're going up and down with your foot to start and stop the machine, which I just think is, is super interesting that it has survived that motion, but it's just in a very different way. So, uh, which is just super cool. One of the other very interesting differences between my sewing machine and uh, some of the other ones that we looked at today is that it's computerized. Got it plugged in and turned on. So as I was uh, saying, it's interesting because you have the, the pedal motion. I just put the pedal down on the floor so I can actually use it. Oh, and it's also, it's computerized, so it tells me when the foot's not down. All right, so you can see it goes really fast. Another thing that's really interesting about this is that it has still the hand crank motion here too. That you can see that it's kind of built in. You have both. You have this hand crank motion. And you also have the pedal motion, both of which have kind of combined into the modern machine. 
because I have definitely sat here and cranked some very thick fabric through that I didn't feel comfortable doing the pedal motion, just plowing through it. If you need a little bit more control, a little bit more, uh, well, just if you need a little bit more control, this gives it to you and gives it to you at a slower speed. Another interesting thing about my machine is that it comes in three different speeds. So you have the very slow speed, you have medium speed, and you also have really fast speed. It used to be uh, with electronic machines before you have all these fancy sliding knobs and such, is that is how fast you do the pedal. So if I just put the, so right now I have it on, is this really fast? Okay, right now I have it on really fast. But if I just slightly press my pedal, it still is going to go slow. That's on really fast, but I'm just only pressing the pedal a little bit and it's still going to go slow. If I press the pedal a little bit harder, it's going to get speed. And if I floor it, it's going to go really, really fast. Kind of like a car. So that's also very similar to how you would have a treadle sewing machine. However fast you do the pedal motion is how fast the machine is going to go. You can go really, 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 really fast, or you can try and take it slower. Of course, this is much easier. Uh, you don't really have to get into a rhythm with this pedal instead of a treadle. Uh, you don't have to have as much rhythm. You can, just, you can just kind of floor it if you would like to. Another interesting thing about this one, um, this sewing machine, opposed to some of the other ones that we've looked at today, is that it's computerized. It has all of its little nice beep boops uh, in a whole screen. It has two panels where it actually does kind of a little bit of embroidery, uh, where it does these letters. It just does the block letters. And then it also does all of these different stitches. And the way that I would choose these different types of embroidery is by pushing or minusing these buttons here, because they each correspond with a number that is on the, the panel. I have no idea what I'm doing here. And they also are going to need a lot of different feet for the sewing machine, which has been a thing since sewing machines have been around. They have different feet for different things. Uh, you got to see some really cool old sewing machine feet on my treadle sewing machine. This one, I didn't bring all of the different feet, uh, but if you wanted to change the feet, you just kind of push it off and then you can put it back on. Can I do it backwards? We'll find out. There we go. All right. This one also has a drop bobbin. So you just kind of drop the bobbin in here. This one's a self-threading bobbin though, so it's going to be, it's easier. Uh, it's like an actual true drop bobbin where you drop it in and then I just go whoop around this little plastic part here and it threads itself. The other ones you're going to have to kind of like sit there and like dip the needle down, dip it back up to make sure that it actually comes through. This one, it's much easier. They modernized it and made my life simpler. This, there we go. I'm going to put, and then it has just this nice little plastic piece that goes over it instead of the other ones that have a metal sliding portion, but it still is kind of the same motion of the sliding portion, which I think is really cool. This is a brother, instead of having it embroidered, they have a sticker on the back instead of embossed in gold, it's a sticker on the back. Um, but this is a bra brother model XR9000 and the product code is 885S39. Thank you so much for joining me on this journey of sewing through time today. I hope you enjoyed. I certainly enjoyed getting to show and talk about different sewing machines and sewing technology through the ages. Thank you so much for your support and for being a digital member. And if you would like to help us reach our April donation goal, the link is in the description. Until next time, stay safe and take care.